Hi everyone, welcome to Watch It Play Table Talk Back. My name is Rodney Smith. In this episode, we're going to take a look at your responses to the question, how do we decide what to play? Specifically, when we're sitting down with a group of friends, family, maybe for a night of gaming. Now, I suppose playing alone, you could have your own sets of challenges, but it's probably going to be a little different <laughs> than what you'd face with a group of people with varying opinions. So let's dive right in. Fet's Bounty 07 writes, What we did was let the winner decide what game to play with the rule that the same game can only be played twice. I thought this was a neat idea. It certainly gives a, an added bonus to the winner of the game. Although I suppose you could run into a situation if there's one or two people who win most of the games in your game group, they might get to choose an awful lot. I know that means that in my game group, I wouldn't be choosing that often. Grant Allen wrote, I want to maximize my playing time at all costs. And if that means I have to say, let's play this, <laughs> then that's fine with me. I thought it was good to highlight the benefits potentially of having someone take charge. You're going to need that if people are being really indecisive, especially if you're somebody who just wants to get down and start playing. You may have to be the one to speak up. And if other people are getting tired of one person always taking the reins, well, hopefully, maybe, that will encourage them to speak up and assert themselves too. J Ward 1465 kind of follows up on this idea. He says, there needs to be a leader, someone to act as a facilitator for the group, or the group could be paralyzed by no one taking action or develop into chaos by everyone taking action. We have a rule. If you don't speak up, you can't speak out. I think this is a good philosophy because you need to be consistent. If you're somebody who's uncomfortable speaking out during the game selection, then waiting until after the game has been chosen is the wrong time to suddenly find your voice. I think it's better to develop that assertiveness during the game selection process. Angel Walker wrote, when I post my monthly meetups, I give each one a theme, generally based on a game mechanic. This Sunday is card drafting games. Now this is not a hard and fast rule. I always emphasize that open gaming is an option. I just like the idea of themed nights. And I would, could see you doing it based on mechanics, but even just, again, based on the theme alone. I was talking with the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast guys in one of the recent episodes, and you'll hear us talk about, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have kind of a mythological evening where you played Kemet and games like Cyclades together. Maria Ryder writes, perhaps everyone bring a game that they'd like to play, or several, and then everyone puts their games out for display. And people choose three in secret and write them in order of rank on a piece of paper. Then those are collected and tallied. The first game that has the most votes gets played first, and the second, if time allows, and the third, and so on. I've done something similar to this in our gaming group. Uh, I think it was Pep who proposed the idea, and we all voted on a piece of paper, or sort of one, two, maybe three games that we wanted to go with. And then if you picked a game first, that got three points. The second game you picked got two points and so on. This allowed you to sort of come up with a tally because otherwise I think most people would probably pick their own game first, but that's where those second and third vote ranks come into play. Sidrock wrote, we discuss it days before by email or chat. So when the day of play comes, we know exactly what game we're going to play. There were a lot of people who suggested something very similar to this. So this is, I think, must be a good idea. We have a Facebook page for our game group, and usually we use that to discuss who's going to be coming, is it still on, <laughs> what time are we starting, that sort of thing. But someone else also brought up in our game group maybe talking in advance about what games we're going to play. So I think if you have a Facebook page or a meetup page, that's a good place to start planning out some of those things. And if you feel a little uncomfortable speaking your mind in front of other people, well, this just gives you a slightly easier format in which to express your opinion. Jennifer Williams writes, When my gaming group can't decide or agree on a game to play, we make a collaborative list of our top six games we'd be interested in playing and then roll a six-sided die. <laughs> well, if I wanted my games to get played, I just know I'd have to make sure they were in the one and two slots because that's how I roll. TJ Jackson wrote, Psychologist Barry Swartz coined the paradox of choice. And his research found that having too many options leads to paralysis of making a choice and can leave people feeling less satisfied when a choice is made. Because then you begin to imagine and fantasize an alternative better choice, which in turn manifests into regret, subtracting satisfaction from the choice that was made. Maybe bring only a handful of games to choose from. Given a small selection, the group should be able to collectively find a game they want to play, will reach that conclusion faster, and will probably be happier about their choice. I just really like this contribution because it sort of provides a little bit of a, an academic reasoning for some of the challenges we have when we're sitting down and trying to pick a game to play. I know myself, I try before I go to game group to narrow it down to the few core things that I imagine we'll be able to fit into game night. 
And then pretty soon I start thinking, oh, you know what? What if this person shows up? They would really like to play this game. Or, you know what? If we have this exact number of players, the perfect game would be this one. But what if we get one more or one less? And then pretty soon I <laughs> put a whole couple of boxes together trying to find that perfect game. But I just wonder if that striving for the perfect game just ends up being more detrimental than just trying to find a few reasonable choices. J.B. Stegmeier contributed with these comments. I look around my room and I pick out four to five games and I ask if anyone wants to veto any of those games. That eliminates ones that at least one person really doesn't want to play. Then I ask if anyone really wants to play one of the games I mentioned. And if there is one such game, other people usually chime in right away. If they don't, we usually talk about it for a few seconds and find one that everyone's happy with. The whole process usually takes less than a minute. I thought this built really nicely on that previous suggestion about trying to narrow down the choices and limiting the options people have to choose from. And this just provides additional ways to sort of narrow it down from there, I think, so that the majority of people are going to feel like they've signed off on the game that they're playing. And that whole idea doesn't surprise me, coming from Jamie, who's one of the most collaborative game designers that I've seen on the internet. During his Kickstarter process, he engages people in both the design and the production elements, and I think that's just wonderful. Listen, he has a fantastic blog I highly recommend that you check out. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video, where he talks about the lessons that he's learned, both in designing games and running successful Kickstarters. If you have an interest in either of those things, I don't know if you're going to find a more valuable resource. Oh, I need to add one more suggestion there. Funding the Dream is a podcast by Richard Bliss that I've been listening to a lot recently, and they talk a lot there about board gaming Kickstarters specifically, but just the whole process in general and how to be successful at it. And I think there's a lot of great tips there, perhaps worth checking out. But let's go to Steve Garrison, who's gonna get me back on topic here. He says, we found the easiest way is to say to one person, pick three games. Then to the next person, eliminate which game you want to play the least. And then finally, someone else gets to make the decision between two games. That makes it fast to get to gaming and no one feels like they're pressuring anyone else, but they're still getting to contribute to the decision. I like this. It's similar to what Jamie said, but I felt like this was a more refined, very quick process. I think, though, it would only really work if you're going to give the decision-making over to three people. So if you have a small gaming group, this would be a solution. Or if you have a larger gaming group and you're breaking into smaller groups, this could work as well. Destrio writes, one challenge is a gaming group being so big that it's difficult to play some of the games that you have. Not everyone wants to play a six or more player game, and most modern games are in the two to five player range. This is a big challenge. If you have a group that needs to break up into smaller groups, well, if choosing the game was difficult, choosing who to play with can be even more difficult because then it can appear like you're you're sort of announcing your preference of who you want to play with, even if that's not the case. Even if it's just a matter of, well, I really would like to play that game and it looks like that person wants to play it as well. Choosing to do that can just be sending a signal to other people, well, what I'm really trying to do is play a game with that person specifically and not with you. Ooh, if choosing a game is socially awkward, that can present some really social challenges as well. Kra5139 says, we'll usually each suggest something in turn and one of the group will roll their eyes and groan a little. <laughs> we repeat this process until there are no groans and we have a winner. <laughs> the no groan approach, <laughs> I just like that. Nine Lord Fox wrote, what I usually do is leave my selection of games out. I give a brief description of them and then we all play a super light game like Love Letter. This gives the players time to digest the selection and get a feeling of what they're in the mood for. You know, I thought this was a great suggestion, kind of like a, kind of like an appetizer before a meal, right? You're, you're having a chance to get a feel for the people around the table, for the gameplay, and kind of just what you're in the mood for. You know, uh, am I feeling like something a little heavier? Maybe I'm feeling a little more competitive tonight. Whatever it is, maybe that little light game gives you the time to make that decision. Alan Robinson wrote, I'm up for anything. Maybe another way to say, I'm here for the social interaction, the fellowship, and the laughs. So I really am up for anything because I try to game with people whose company I enjoy enough that it really does not matter what we're doing. I thought this was a good point to raise because I kind of poo-pooed the idea that anyone is really up for anything. But a version of interpreting that closer to what Alan is saying, where you're, what you're really saying is, I'm up for doing any kind of activity with this group, Maybe something like that, it's possible to be true. I have a hard time really imagining that myself, like that could be part of my personality type at work against me there, but something about that does ring true. 
So Alan, thanks for raising that point. Cheshire Tomcat 68 wrote, any chance of seeing your gaming group in action or are they a bit camera shy? I wouldn't call them camera shy, but the reality is if I bring a bunch of cameras to my game group, it's going to turn into work for me. <laughs> and my game group is an opportunity for me to just sort of kick back, relax, and sort of not be thinking about specifically watch it played and the content I'm creating for the channel. Although even there, I suppose I usually am bringing games I'm thinking about <laughs> playing on the series. So I don't know, maybe some point in the future it's something I'd consider. I did actually shoot a video with a different gaming group that I sometimes go and visit. And we played Game of Thrones and we just sort of showed some highlights there from the gameplay. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. I am Turbo GFX wrote, sometimes a good moment to decide on which game to play is at the end of your previous session. Chances are that everyone's more outspoken by the time your session has ended. Not much for me to say here. I just thought this was a clever insight and a good idea. Streaky Pro wrote, someone at my most recent game day had a good solution for this problem. Each game gets described briefly. Then on the count of three, everyone points at two games they would want to play and we played the one that got the most votes. You get an honest answer without even having to articulate your preferences. I just thought this was a great idea because it ends in a Mexican standoff. <laughs> so for sure, I am gonna try this at the very least for the fun of it. Peter Horowski writes, I've been working on a web app that pulls collection information from Board Game Geek and then lets our gaming group request that games be brought Note what you intend to bring and provide a voting mechanism to allow for some of that information to be settled beforehand. We also want to link those upvoted games to videos, such as Watch It Played, thank you very much, Peter, and PDF rules so people can get a head start on a new game. Peter, I just thought this was a really great idea and I hope you're gonna keep me posted. Send me uh, an email at watchitplayedatlive.com as you make some progress here. I'd like to be able to share that with our viewers because I think it's a, it's a great idea. And there was just a bunch of really great ideas that were shared with us that I wasn't able to share here just so I could keep this episode to a reasonable length. But go back to the previous episode or table talk and look at the different comments. There's some great ideas there. We also got some fantastic video responses that I want to share with you now. Stick around for that. But until the next episode, thanks for watching. So, what do you want to play? Huh? Do you want to play uh, Munchkin, a wonderful game about cards and, and stuff? Or do you want to play that popular French game, Munchkin? Yeah, I know, my French is terrible. It's almost as bad as my Vassalitian. But, be it as it may. Um, you know, Rodney? This question always comes up at every gaming group that I attend is, oh, what game do you want to play? And their response is normally, n'importe quoi, which is French for whatever. I think it's just a case of politeness. You know, I, I don't want to step on anyone's toes and so I will play anything. And I've come to realise over the years that playing anything can be hazardous for your health. The good thing about that is sometimes you will play a game and it will be a gem and it will be something which is really, uh, that is a gem actually, he's got in his hand. But it'll be uh, a, a game that you go out and buy because you really, really adore it. Um, the only problem sometimes is you will end up playing a game that you don't like. Um, and that game probably will take longer than normal and feel like it's longer than normal on top of it being longer than normal. You know what game I'm talking about? So my solution to this problem is that nowadays I go into the gaming group and I say, OK, um, uh, I would like to play that, that and that because I know the games and I like the games. And then I say, OK, I wouldn't mind testing that, that and that because they're games that are new and I haven't seen before and it may be very interesting. Normally, the people that are organising these gaming groups are very, very good at... Um, choosing a game and say, okay, well, we'll test this one because I know that so-and-so wants to test this as well. So you, then they get the group together, they teach the game to you and you play the game, and which is great. And sometimes you're teaching a game while playing a game at the same time as well. I don't know if that happens in your group, but um, I think you need to draw a line and say, okay, look, uh, these games I wouldn't mind playing, those games uh, I wouldn't want to touch. So there you have it, Rodney. So if you excuse me, I've got work to do. I've got to dust all my little figures. Okay. Now let's start from A, A with A, Agricola, there we go. Hey Rodney, I agree with you. I see the same problem when people get together to play a game, it's hard to say, you know, I want to play this, or oh, maybe you're timid about 
telling other people what you want to play, but I think everyone needs to take a turn. I think it's important. Either you have a schedule or some random way to pick a turn that it's your turn to choose the game. Like, for example, I have this Android app that we sometimes use to decide who's going to pick. Um, I'm sure there's similar apps that you can use for other uh, iPhone or whatever else, but it will just, everyone puts their finger on and whichever one is purple, they get to pick the game. Now, if it's your turn to pick a game, just pick one. Pick something that you want to play. And if there's some, and if, if it's something you really want to play but everyone else hates it, well, they should give you the chance, which I guess leads to the next thing is if it's not your turn to pick, be open to trying new things. And if it's really something you hate, maybe sit it out or be honest about it. But give the other people a chance to pick one too. And I think in that way, people can all have a turn. The first thing that came to my mind was actually the opposite of Rodney's problem. I go to a few meetups and all, and some private games, and in, especially in the meetups, there's this few regular people who do the opposite. They demand other people bring games, they demand to they book a seat in a game, and they never bring anything. They basically don't contribute anything than themselves, basically. On top of that, I'll give you an example of how they do it. They will ask a person to bring game, a specific name, specific game, and then the person will bring it, and if any other text comes between, they will say things like, so you're not bringing it anymore? They don't, you know, make it sound like it's not a privilege they're playing someone's game. It's an obligation to them. Like, wait a minute, you promised me to bring the game, you know? If you don't want to bring games, that's fine, but you don't have any, um, there's no obligation for it. To be respectful, basically. And actually this leads to the second point, which is that attitude of truthfulness or of being a vassalite, basically. Thumbs up to Barry Dublé on that. Um, because of Vas because like Tom Vasso said, if you don't like someone or if you feel someone has bad behavior, you just come up and be respectful and tell them, you know, I mean, I mean, be forward about it. And this leads to the point of what Rodney said, but up for anything. Now, this is important uh, because I agree totally with Rodney. The up for anything thing, most of the time, in my view, is damaging because there are times where everybody is up for everything, up for everything. And then there's the awkward silence and people talk about a game. Then they're like, do you want to play the game? Then people start talking about game. One time, with such little precious gaming time, that at that experience, 20 minutes was spent talking about a game, and still after that, no one chose a game. So to give a physical example of how I solve it, recently someone joined our group, he loves Zokin, loves it. Okay? So he loves Zokin a lot. I like, recently I've been playing a lot of war games, but I'm not too keen on Zokin to be absolutely honest, and he's not the most keen on war games. But because we know that, what happens is I don't. I told him truthfully that I would not. I rather not play Zokin every week. At most, once a month. And same thing. He said that he's not too keen on war games. So when we meet each other, we compromise. Once in a while, I'll play Zokin. Once in a while, he'll play a war game, and we get along really fine. See, rather than if we had kept quiet, then there would be this huge bad tension. I don't like him because every time he comes, he wants to play Zokin, and every time he sees me, he's like, "Oh, it's the war game guy." So you see, so by just telling each other truthfully and respectfully I feel that it just everybody benefits so um, thank you very much and great topics Rodney till next word hey Rodney Hunter from weapons grade tabletop uh, I like this question quite a bit but I have a different challenge where I used to just have standby classics that my group would love to play all the time now I'm having to play new games like Kickstarter prototypes and things that are just coming out and I'm having to learn new games all the time and my group doesn't always want to learn new games. So what I've tried to start doing is instead of just constantly barraging our group with new games, uh, try to get a, enough knocked out in one night to where next time we don't even have to touch a new game. We can just sit down and play some classics like Cosmic Encounter or even modern classics like Mice and Mystics, which we just started revisiting to try to beat the original campaign so that we can have an excuse to get the expansion. Uh, so, it's not the best solution, because I still have to get those other games onto the table, but it's kind of a compromise that's helping us out quite a bit. I think that's the best way for us to do it at the moment, uh, but if you have any other suggestions, I'd be glad to hear them. As always, thanks for that uh, topic. It's a really good topic, and hopefully I can participate in these in the future. Thanks.